Moses leads the people out of Egypt. They take a jaunt across the Sea of Reeds, stop by to pick up the Ten Commandments, spend 40 years in the desert learning how to live by those commandments. Moses hands off to Joshua, they go into the Promised Land, and then that's, that's the Promised Land. They live in the Promised Land, and here comes King Saul. That's how we kind of think about the, the story of Scripture. The thing is, if you look at the dates, there's a gap there. We don't go straight from Moses and Joshua to then Saul, David, and Solomon. Moses in the wilderness is about 1448 to 1408. And Saul doesn't become king until 1050. There's 358 years between Moses and the first king of Israel. 358 years. The story of that, those years, those 358 years, is told in a book called Judges. And we think of Judges, and as I say the word judge, what comes to mind is uh, long black robes, law, courts, control, the, the way things ought to be done. Right? The judges are the embodiment of order. And um, that's not what this is. The book of Judges might be the most misnamed book in the Bible. I see the book of Judges telling the story of these 358 years as more of the Wild West of Scripture. It's the time period in which things would go wrong and then someone uh, would ride into town to clean this place up and put it back in order before riding off into the sunset. I mean, it's kind of a, that feel to it, to, to the book of Judges. It, it's, it's the Wild West of Scripture. So, the Judges tells us at the beginning, the book of Judges tells us what, what's going on. It tells us, now the angel of the Lord said to the Jewish people, I brought you up out of Egypt to the land that I promised you is your to your ancestors, and said, I will not break my covenant with you, but you, you have broken your covenant with me. And so now I will not drive out the other inhabitants of these lands from before you. They shall become adversaries to you, and their gods shall be a snare to you, a temptation, something you fall, uh, fall to. And that's what starts to happen. Joshua, son of Nun, dies at the age of 110 years. Moreover, that whole generation was gathered to their ancestors, and another generation grew up after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. This happens. One generation dies, the next generation forgets what their parents knew oh so very well. This new generation did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and worshipped the Baals, the false gods. They abandoned, they abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors. And so the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. And he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them. Then the Lord would raise up judges who would deliver them out of the power of those who plundered them. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge, the Lord is with the judge, and the Lord would be moved to pity to send this judge by the groaning of those who were persecuted and oppressed. But whenever the judge died, they would relapse and behave worse than their ancestors. Right? And so this is, this is what happens. There's this pattern where the judge would come along when things were bad, and things would get better, and the judge would die, and then things would get worse again. And so there are 12 of these judges, 12 of these cycles. The 12 judges are Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Deborah, Gideon, Tola, Jer, Jephthah, Ibzan, Elon, Abdon, and Samson. And the, the 12, 12 judges, the reason they're, they're called is uh, like the, the central, the sentence that captures the sense of judges. Right. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes, for there was no king in Israel. That, that's the refrain throughout Judges. Why, is things, why are things going off the rails? Because everyone does what is right in their own eyes. Not what is right in God's eyes, they're, they're doing what is right in their own eyes. <clears throat> and so, there, there's a pattern with each of these Judges. Othniel is the first of them. And you read about Othniel, and you think, this might be a bit of a snoozer. Because Othniel is... 
Well, you read about Othniel. The Othniel, the Israelites, lived among uh, all these different tribes. And they, they fall astray, marrying the daughters of other tribes. The Israelites did what was evil. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against evil. And he sold them into the hand of King Cushan Rishathim. And the Israelites served them for the eight years. But the Israelites called out the Lord, the God, who then raised up from to deliver the Israelites, Othniel. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war and won, and they had the land had rest for 40 years. So that's the, that's the pattern. And you read the first judge, and you think, well, this might be a bit boring. Let me tell you about the second judge. The second judge is Ehud, the left-handed man. The Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon of Moab against Israel because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And so uh, the Israelites have to send a, a tribute to this king, this Eglon. And so they would send grain and gold and silver. And this time, uh, Ehud is called by God to respond. And so he's the one who takes the gold and the silver and the grain. And he also takes with him a sword. It's a cubit long, a foot and a half long. And he's left-handed. And so if you're right-handed, you hold a sword on your left hip, so you can draw across your body. If you are left-handed, though, your, your sword is on your right hip. And so when he goes in to see the king, he can sneak his sword in, because that where you search someone for a sword, you search where they would pull their sword from. Not the, but they assume everyone's right-handed. And so he sneaks in, this left-handed man, who seems to be, uh, without, seems to be without weapons, and he tells the king, I have a secret to tell you. I have a message. And it's only for your ears. So the king dismissed the servants. And then um, he had came to him. This is a 320. While he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber. And he says, I have a message from God. Then he would reach with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and thrust it into Eglon's belly. The hilt also went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not draw the sword out of his belly, and dirt came out. If you stick a sword through someone's belly, and dirt comes out, well, it might be brown, but I don't think it was actually dirt. Then Ehud escaped out of the vestibule, and after he had gone, the servants came, and, and they're, they're wondering, he must be relieving himself in the cool chamber. And the doors are locked. They can't get in. And so they, they think he's relieving himself. Well, why? Well, what, a, what are they smelling? Right? And so they, they finally, they break in when they, it gets too long. And they find their Lord dead on the floor. And Ehud escaped while they delayed. And he calls Israel to revolt. And they rise up and they eject this invading army. And then there is peace in the land. The land had rest for 80 years. The next of the judges is Deborah. The Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. And so the Lord sold them into the hand of King Jabin of Canaan. And during this time, Deborah was the judge. Deborah judged sitting underneath a palm tree between two towns. People would come to her to bring uh, concerns or questions, and she would judge between them. She would tell them what needed to happen. And when this happened, she summoned Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh and Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take a position on Mount Tabor, bringing 10,000 from the tribe of Naphtali and the tribe of Zebulon. And Barak looks at Deborah, and his, his knees start knocking together, and he is afraid. And he says, I will go and do this if you will come with me. And Deborah looks at him and says, Okay, I'll go. But you're being a weenie. This will not be to your glory. Another will get the glory for this. And so that's what happens, right? So the, he calls together this army, and 10,000 people are gathered at this Mount Tabor. And the invading army, led by a, ge a general, a general by the name of Sisera, they can't not respond. Like, now there's a military force in the field. They have to respond and make sure this, this country that they've conquered continues to be... Uh, under their control. 
And so they put together their army. And what makes it so frightening is they have 900 iron chariots. And a chariot, if you could imagine war horses running towards you and pulling a chariot with people on it who are pointing swords or pointing a spears, long spears, out towards you. And then another person in the chariot shooting arrows at you as it rides towards you. And it's pretty scary. This is a modern day, or this would be the equivalent of like a modern day tank. And so he has his line of, of tanks, of chariots, and they're going to charge these 10,000. And they, the Israelites win. These 10,000 unexpectedly win. And so Sisera is fleeing the battlefield. And as he flees, he comes across an area. He thinks he's safe. He's tired. He needs to stop. He's in the land of the Kenites. And he doesn't know anything about the Kenites, or he doesn't know one important detail about them. What he doesn't know is that the Kenites are Moses' in-laws. Like Moses. Moses, when he leaves Egypt, he gets married, and his in-law, his father-in-law, mother-in-law, those are the Kenites. And so, J.L. is one of the women of the Kenite clan, and she sees Sisera fleeing, and she understands what's happening, and she says, come on in here. Come on in here, and uh, I, I have something. I, I, I will help you, right? And so he turned aside into her tent, and she covered him with a rug, saying, Turn aside, have no fear. And he says to her, Give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. And so she, she does more than water. She opens up a skin of milk and gives him milk to drink. And at this point, he is tired. He's been in a, a pitched battle. He's curled up in a rug and a blanket. He's had some more milk. He falls asleep. That's what happens. He falls asleep. He falls asleep. And we read... Jael, the wife of Heber, took a tent peg and a hammer in her hand and went softly to him and drove the tent peg into his temple until it went down into the ground at the other side of his temple. And he was lying fast asleep from weariness and died. Then as Barak came in pursuit of Sisera, Jael went out to meet him and said to him, Come and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. Seeking. So he went into her tent and there was Sisera lying dead with a tent peg in his temple. Like all these books about women of the Bible, I always wonder, why don't they write about Jael? Like, she's impressive. I don't know if it's impressive in a good way, but that's impressive. And the Lord in the land had rest for 40 years. One of the next judges was a dude by the name of Gideon. And Gideon is one that we know because Gideon is uh, the one who puts the fleece out and says, if it's really you calling God, make, he puts the fleece out overnight. He says, make the uh, ground damp and the fleece dry in the morning. And then the next morning he says, well, I'm not sure if I really believe it, can you make the fleece wet and the ground and the ground surrounding ground dry without any dew the next morning? And so he's, the way he says it is he knows that he's, he's trying to test it. And Gideon ends up being the one who again and again and again just kind of asks, is, it, is this really, come on, really, can I get some reassurance? And so Gideon spends his entire time needing reassurance. When he first is called to do something, he says, are, are you really a messenger from God? Can you stay here? We need to have a meal together so you can do that, that thing where you like take up an offering and, and you burn it in front of me so I can go know it's really you. And, and then he does the thing with the fleece. And then when he has his army put together, he has a messenger who goes down to listen to the invading army just to make, cause, just to make sure that they understand what the invading army is, is, is afraid. And Gideon is just kind of, he needs a lot of reassurances. Gideon is also the one, when he gathers this army to fight off the, the invading nation, uh, he gathers 22,000 people, and, and God tells him, this is too many, send home everyone who's afraid. And so he has 10,000. And then he goes down to the river, and, and he is told, have everyone get a drink of water, and only keep the people who lap out of the river like dogs and lean all the way down. Don't Anyone who drinks water with your cupped hands, send those home. And so he has 300. And then they take those 300, and in the middle of the night, they surround the enemy camp, and they have horns and torches and, and, and uh, pieces of pottery, big pieces of pottery. 
And they smash the pottery, light the torches, blow the horns, and then start calling out for God and for Israel. And the invading army thinks that they are surrounded, and they are, and that they're all about to die, and so they run. And, and that breaks the army, that they break and, and they scatter. And so the land had rest 40 years in the days of Gideon. And then the last of the judges I'll tell you about today, another of these interesting stories of judges, is the story of Jephthah. And Jephthah, uh, he, his mom, his parents, it, uh, it's a complicated family situation. His dad has multiple wives, and his mom is one of the less favored wives. And so, uh, as a prostitute, actually, is what the scripture tells us. And so all of his half-siblings cast him out, saying, you will not get a share of the inheritance. We, we're going to cast you out. And so he leaves, and he goes off, and he puts together a group of uh, raiders, people who will raid to try to raid and get grain and make a living that way. And so when, they, when Israel is invaded by the Ammonites, uh, the, uh, Jephthah's tribe comes to him and says, we need you to defend us. And he says, you, you cast me out. Why should I come and defend you? And they say, well, we, we did cast you out, and we, we still need your help. And so he tells them, if this is going to happen, you're going to have to make it worth my while. And so they, they say they will. And then Jephthah sends a letter to the invading Ammonites, and, and they start rehashing this history of, you done me wrong, why, why are you here? And No, you done me wrong first. And, and they argue back and forth two or three times, and they finally come to battle. And Jephthah makes a promise, he says to God, a vow to the Lord, if you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whoever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return victorious shall be the Lord's an offering by me as a burnt offering. Like, whenever I'm coming home, like, can you think of anyone that you could come home to that if they came out of the house, you'd be okay offering them up as a burnt offering? Like, the cat would be a, that would be a shame. I'd miss my cat. I like my cat, but like, any, any of the, like that's, that would be the, the worst of, of the, this, that would be like the least bad option, right? If you just think about what he's saying, this is just a horrible idea. There's no way that this is going to go well for him. And, and this is the vow he makes. It's not what God is asking for, the, a sacrifice, but that's what he, vow he makes. And so he, he wins against the Ammonites and he goes home and his daughter rushes out to greet him and he looks at his daughter and he says, alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low. He's blaming her. He's the one who made this stupid vow. You have become the cause of trouble for me, for I've opened my mouth to the Lord and I cannot take back my vow. And she says to him, My father, if you have opened your mouth to the Lord, to the Lord, do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth. And she said to her father, Let this thing be done to me. Grant me two months so that I might go and wander on the mountains and bewail this fate. And that's what, that's what she does. She goes and bewails for two months. And um, at the end of two months, she returned to her father who did with her according to the vow he had made. So these were the judges. These are stories that are not often told. These are the stories from the Wild West of, of Scripture, the Wild West of the history of Israel. And what holds them together seems to be two things. First, if you look at them, none of them are disqualified from helping to do God's will, even though they all have their hang-ups. Ehud's predilection for violence Barak, even though he struggles to trust. Gideon, who needs reassurance all the time. Jephthah, though he makes a very rash decision. Right? I'm not worried about anyone serving God or saying that they aren't able to serve God because I look at these folks and say, if they can do it, well, just about anyone can do it. That's the first way I see these holding together. The second way is which... In, in the middle of a time in which everyone did what was right in their own eyes, like that's the problem in Judges, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. They have forgotten the lessons of the wilderness in which they had to learn how to do what was right in God's eyes, following the Torah, the teaching, right? 
they have set that aside and they're doing what's right in, the, in their own eyes. And in this time, the judges are the people who are standing up and saying, we're going to do what's right in God's eyes. We're going to stand up for what is right in the middle of, of a culture that doesn't seem to know what right is. And though I would not recommend their methods, tent pegs, let's not use tent pegs to enforce God's will, please. However, the boldness there is something I think is worth paying attention to. They're willing to stand up and to say, this is what honors God. And in the same way, I think we can do the same today. We can be the people who stand up that, and say, we don't just honor God on Sunday. We honor God throughout the week. We don't just pass the peace on Sunday. We are people who make peace throughout the week. We don't just offer God our best on Sunday. We offer God our best throughout the week. We stand up for what is right throughout the week. Other people can do what is right in their eyes, do as they see fit. We stand up and do what is right in God's eyes. Because that's who we are. We're the people who follow Jesus and do what is right in his eyes. Amen.